Memorial Weekend. You got a little bit of my background. Yes, the name is David. I've got two last names, by the way, just like a married woman. One is Tal, one is Goldberg, depending on, you know, where I am. Uh, I've got stories about everything, including why I have two last names. Maybe we'll go into that. But the first thing I need to say is thank you. Thank you for allowing me to stand here and to defend my country. And like you've heard, for the last 40 years, I've been defending my country from the back of a tank. I'm a tank commander, I'm a major in the IDF, I command a tank company, which is about 11 tanks and about 100 men. Or in biblical terms, I'm an Israeli centurion, okay, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and all of my life, for six years in regular army and then uh, another 35 years in reserves, it's been my job to defend my country from that tank and on the ground and in the alleys and in whatever. But um, a couple of years ago, they took my tank company away from me and gave it to somebody younger, more handsome. I can't, I'm learning how to deal with that. But, um, and this is my role now to go and help people understand who Israel is, what Israel is, and mostly to help Christians to understand why you have an obligation to Israel. So that's what I'm going to try to do here today. Let's see if I can get myself set up a little bit. And we're going to talk about two battles that are going on right now. Um, the first is the battle for Israel. And again, if you kind of followed what happened last week, you've heard about rockets, you've heard about bombs, you've heard about uh, uh, demonstrations, you've heard about all of that. So that's one war, and maybe I'm, I'm here to explain a little bit about that war so you know what's going on. But for the first time in my life, no, the second time in my life, I've been sitting overseas and watching what happened to Israel on CNN, Fox News, BBC. I got to tell you, it's terrible. It's terrible to watch it from here. It's terrible not to be there. It's terrible not to hear. I mean, just think about something happening to your kid and you're on the other side of the world. I mean, it's, it's horrific. But as I was sitting and watching what was going on, I understood that there's two wars going on. There's one war for Israel, for the physical daily life of the people living in Israel. But that is a war that I can understand and I can hopefully explain here. But there's another war going on for the truth. And I was watching the truth be murdered on each and every television station and each and every website and each and every post, you have lost the war on truth. And I'm gonna explain what that means and why that's a problem and maybe help you pick up a little bit or fight what we call a defensive battle, at least for part of the truth. So let's tie all this together. And the first thing I need you to know, and let's put this for, for and we're, we're going to be talking about this. I'm going to see if I can get a piece of Psalm 15, which very appropriately is a song of David. Okay, not connecting. We're, you know, just family. And it says this, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks uprightly, who works righteousness, and speaks the truth in his heart. The Bible numerous times makes a direct connection between God and truth. It's not just enough to worship God. There has to be truth involved. So I'm here to speak a little bit of the truth about Israel, about what is happening, how it's happening, why it's happening. We're going to go a little bit into the history, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how the truth came to go to, together. But let's go back to the beginning in the beginning and say why we're even here. Or, or like I like to say, the who, what, where, and why. And like everything else, and this is something, I, again, I, I'm really grateful to be speaking in churches like this where the Bible is the center of the church. You've got a pastor who, who, who actually pours out the Bible on a regular basis because I don't have to convince you about things that I have to convince other people sometimes. But the who, first and all, foremost, is God. That's the center all of this turns around. In my case, though, it's God that promised my people a very specific piece of geography. 
We're not sure always why. I can go into all kinds of different discussions about why he did this and who he did this. But God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis to connect a land to a people to himself. And why did he do that? Because he's God. He doesn't need an excuse. He doesn't need a reason. He doesn't say even. He says, I made that connection. And as far as I'm concerned, that is a promise that was made back in Genesis that still exists today. God does not break promises. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If God breaks promises, what does that mean for you? So let's agree that God doesn't break promises. So, we have the chosen people, we have the promised land, we have God. But I'm going to tell you, it's not always been easy. And I'm going to do a really, really quick historical overview and talk a little bit about this. Now, again, most of you have heard some of this in the background. Most of you have connected to some of this. But let's see if I can do kind of quickly. Because being the, the chosen people in the promised land is not really easy sometimes. Anybody see Fiddler on the Roof? You remember what Tuvia said about being the promise to the chosen people? I don't know if you remember. He goes, God, God, I know we're the chosen people. But couldn't you have chosen somebody else? <laughs> it's not easy. And we're going to connect some of the reasons that it's not easy. A little bit of the history. Okay? Remember, we all kind of were given the promised land. Abraham was given the promised land, but that didn't end there. We had to go down to Egypt, remember? Uh, spend a couple of time, a little bit of time in Egypt. All right? Anybody here Jewish before I say something stupid? <laughs> all right. So, uh, anybody know anybody Jewish? So, I, I mean, we are lawyers, you know, we're doctors. Anybody know any Jewish construction workers? So after building a couple of pyramids in Egypt, you know, the people cried to God and said, no, no, this is not for us. There's no air conditioning. You know, th this doesn't work. So we cry out to God, and God sends us a hero named Moses. Anybody remember? Let my people go. And Moses takes us out of Egypt, brings us back to the promised land. But it doesn't end there. Okay, we had to conquer Jericho, and we had to conquer the cities, and we had to get everything together. It wasn't easy, and we managed to conquer the nation, and then it becomes even more complicated because we don't really get along with each other, and we don't really get along with God. We've got judges who come to save us. Remember the whole book of Judges? And after the sequence, the people come back to uh, Samuel the prophet. They say, give us a king. First king was? Well, Saul. I mean... He didn't have red hair, but he had a big ego. But what I'm trying to say is he was supposed to be a good king, but he kind of messed up a little bit. So the kingdom is taken away from God, Saul, and given to a young man with a beautiful name. Amen. All right. Uh, again, we go through this sequence. Uh, David actually is the one who makes a connection between a specific part of the promised land and God in a specific way. David brings the tabernacle into Jerusalem. And what that does is puts the physical presence of God in the world on Mount Zion. And then when David dies, his son builds a temple. And the temple is where the sacrifice takes place. One of the things I need you to understand about sacrifice, most Christians don't realize this. For Jews, it's very, very clear. The temple in Jerusalem is where the sacrifice takes place. And without sacrifice, there's no redemption of sin. Without redemption of sin, you, come, you cannot come to God the Father. Does that make sense to you? Which means this, the temple in Jerusalem for Jews is what salvation is for Christians. Do you understand what it means when that temple is destroyed? Take the salvation away from the people. Not only was a building destroyed, but when the Romans tear Jerusalem to the ground, raise Jerusalem to the ground, they destroy the second temple, and we become a people without salvation. Now, you know the solution to that problem came a little bit before, but do you understand what that means for us, the Jews? That means we are totally, totally out in the wilderness. And we go into exile for almost 2,000 years. And I can talk to you about uh, Persians. And I can talk to you about Crusaders. And I can talk to you about Ottoman Turks. But one of the things that we never forgot is where we came from. No matter where we were, no matter how bad it was, a Jewish family and every Friday at the end of the Friday meal would say, next year in Jerusalem. 
We always prayed. We always remembered. And we read the Bible. And when the Bible told Ezekiel, go through that valley of dry bones. What do you see? And Ezekiel says, dry bones. And says, no. God says, no. I see something else. I see these bones coming together. I see my people coming back together. And I see them returning to their land. And Ezekiel says, why? Why are you doing this? And God says, so you all know that I am God. And it happens. In 1867, a young man goes through uh, the nation riding on the back of the horse. Let's see if we can find the, uh, there you go. Okay. You know that face? Did you know that he was a tourist in Israel? I mean, you all are following, anytime any of you go on a trip to Israel, you're, you're following the footsteps of Mark Twain. That's weird. Okay. But Mark Twain says this. He's literally riding through the Jezreel Valley. He says, land of milk and honey. Who can call him this the land of milk and honey? It's desolate. Soil is rich, but it's given over totally to weeds. A silent, mournful expanse. A desolation. We never saw a human being on the whole route. Hardly a tree, a shrub. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those friends of worthless soil, had an almost deserted country. It is desolation. It is desolation because we weren't there. But immediately after this, the Jewish people say, enough. A movement comes together that we call the Zionist movement. Anybody ever heard of that? The Zionist movement says Jews should be able to fulfill the prophecies of the Bible. Jews should be able to come back to their homeland. It's a political, it is a national movement, but it's basically a movement that says Jews should come back home. And we start coming back home, we plant the olive trees, we plant, we make roads, but it wasn't very easy. There were people living in the Holy Land, and they didn't like the fact that we came there. Now, don't forget, we were there originally. This is our homeland. There's always been Jews living in the homeland, but they had a problem. We said, let's cooperate. Let's make this a land of milk and honey. But they said, no, there was always... A balagan. Balagan, by the way, is a Hebrew word for mix up, mess up. Um, it's your political system in the United States, a big balagan. Okay? <laughs> if you want to go through that one. It's our political system in Israel, which is even a bigger balagan. I don't know if anybody knows about what's going on. But, okay, so... It, it didn't really end. But we started coming back. The Ottoman Turks actually lose World War I. I'm, I'm, by the way, if anybody here is a history teacher, I'm very sorry for what I'm doing right now. If anybody here is a Bible teacher, I'm very sorry for what I'm doing right now. But let's see if we can tie this together. So the Jews are coming back to their homeland. A lot of the Arabs don't really like it. The world powers are in play. The Ottoman Turks hand the Holy Land and the whole area over to the British. The British take a ruler somewhere in England and make a line here, my line there, and line there, and divide the Middle East into the way they see that the country should be arranged. But one of the things that a lot of people don't know, that in the British Empire's establishment were a couple of born-again Christians. And they knew what Israel was. And they put together a, a, a plan to allow the Jews to have a homeland. They actually wrote a declaration called the Balfour Declaration, I don't know if you've ever heard about it, that says the Jews should return to their homeland. So based on that, at the end of World War I, the British actually take control of this tiny little sliver of land between the Mediterranean Sea and the, and, and the Jordan River, and they have a mandate over that, basically to build, and that's what they declared, to build the Jews a homeland. Now, I need you to understand that we are not a big people. And the homeland that we're talking about is not very big, okay? But these Jews start coming back to their homeland and slowly, slowly rebuilding the land of milk and honey. And then we roll into World War II. Now, I, I need you to kind of put this together. The, the, the process started before World War II. And this is really important because some of our enemies kind of make a connection in a different way. But after World War II, when the camps are open and everybody realized what happened in the Holocaust, there's a scream, there's a yell to let the Jews have a homeland. And the, for the first time in 2,000 years, the world does something positive for the Jews.
They sent a committee in 1947. They say, okay, there's Jews living here. There's Arabs living here. What do we do? The committee kind of goes through the whole thing and actually comes up with what we call the partition plan of 1947. Give part to this and part to that. The Jews said, thank you. The Arabs said, three no's. No negotiation, no compromise, no peace. Basically, it's the whole Arab world saying there is no place for Jews in their homeland. We don't care about the Bible. We don't care about the prophecies. We don't care about the fact that you've always been here. It is our territory, and we are not willing to compromise. There were wars. As a result of this, okay, the Jews said yes, the Arabs say no. The British kind of play the bagpipes and disappear, say deal with it. And in 1948, we, call, we fight a war we call the War of Independence. Anybody heard of, ever heard of this? Okay, because you might have heard it at a different name. Because we gained independence in 1948 in a battle against five Arab nations. Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq actually declared war on Israel. We fought with our backs against the wall, and we managed to save the country at the last moment. But it wasn't easy. Another thing, look at Israel. Can you see it there? That tiny little sliver? You know that we are 0.01% of the globe. I mean, the land mass in Israel is zero points, less than a, 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 a tenth of a percent. Okay, tiny little nation situated between Europe, Asia, and Africa on a very important kind of crossways. By the way, anybody who comes to Israel will understand the importance. Because God gave us an amazing country, a beautiful country. He just put us in a very bad neighborhood. And the neighborhood is going down the drain. We fight wars in 1967, where we expand the area that is under Israeli control. We fight a war in 1973. By the way, these wars against the nations that declared war around us. We managed to hold it together. And at the end of this, Israel is a viable, thriving, Western-style democracy in the middle of a hectic, crazy, going even crazier Middle East. We are an asset to the United States. But we are also a light. And again, I'm not objective, OK? We have probably a higher GDP per capita than France and England. Did you know that? The gross national product of Israel per capita is almost as high as the United States. I mean, we are a modern country, and we've managed to pull this off with one hand tied behind our back because of the security and the military objectives that we have to uphold. I'm not objective, but I'm kind of proud what this tiny little country has managed to do. But we didn't manage to do it alone. And when you think about everything that we've gone through, you've got to realize that God had his fingers in this. My dad, who was a pastor, used to say that if you want to see the fingers of God meddling in the affairs of men in the world today, on a political, geopolitical, military kind of scale, just look at Israel. On the other hand, if you want to see an attack against the fingers of God meddling in affairs, look at Israel. And that's what I'm here to talk about because it didn't come easy. And again and again, Israel has said to its neighbors, let's stop the fight. Let's reach an agreement. Let's compromise. I know compromise is not a good word in your society, but we said, let's compromise. We realize the situation. Let's reach an agreement. After 1948, we tried. After 1967, we tried. After 1973, we tried. It didn't work. We even sat down in Oslo. Anybody ever heard of the Oslo Kurds? We said, okay, let's reach an agreement. But again and again, what are our enemies saying? No negotiation, no compromise, no peace. So at some point, the Palestinians, who are the local people living inside the area that was called Palestine, and I'm not going to go too deep into that, say, okay, some of us are willing to negotiate with Israel. I'm not saying what they were willing to negotiate, but the fact that they were willing to negotiate is really good. What people don't understand, that not all of the Palestinians agree to that. And a large amount of Palestinians say, no negotiation, no compromise, no peace. And they do it for religious Muslim reasons. They're part of a movement that goes all through the Middle East called the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't know if you heard of the Muslim Brotherhood because Al-Qaeda is part of 
the Muslim Brotherhood ideology. ISIS is part of the Muslim Brotherhood ideology, and the Palestinian inside Israel version of Al-Qaeda and ISIS is an organization called, anybody know? The Hamas. Now, if you've been following the news for the last two weeks, you heard a lot about the Hamas. And you heard a lot of people saying, oh, the Hamas, I mean, we need to talk to them, we need to negotiate with them, we need to... But you have to realize that the Hamas is an, a Palestinian version of Al-Qaeda. I mean, bin Laden never said to the United States of America, let's talk and reach an agreement. What did he say? Death. That's what he says. That's what Hamas says. Hamas doesn't want to negotiate with Israel. Hamas says, let's destroy Israel. And the only thing that you're going to get from us, even in a negotiation, is us putting off our destruction of Israel, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe even 10 years. By the way, that's a negotiation that's going on. But they're saying, we want to destroy Israel. And every once in a while, when they want to turn up the flame, they do something very interesting. Two weeks ago, this is what they started. I don't know if you realize, they took an excuse about something that was happening in Jerusalem and did this. Now you see those little starry things up there? They look like firecrackers. They are not. There are high explosive warheads on the top of a missile that's being, let's go back one more. Can I go back? Come on, back, 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 back. One more. And if you look to where the smoke starts, okay, you look that they're being fired out of a base, a facility, no, they're fired, being fired out of civilian population centers. That high explosive rocket is aimed at my mother's house. No, not, let, me, let me say this, and here's one of the things I need you to understand. For us, it's not CNN, it's not the news channel, it's not BBC, it's not history, it's not, it is a high explosive warhead literally aimed at the city of Modine, which is where I live. That's where my children live, that's where my mother lives. It is personal. It's not something weird. It's not Star Wars. And my mother has 15 seconds, no, my mother has 30 seconds to get from her bedroom to the bomb shelter. Every night she has to make sure that the way between the bedroom and the bomb shelter is open because when the siren goes off, she's got to wake up, kind of get herself out of this and run to the bomb shelter because if a bomb falls on the top of the building, she will be safe in that bomb shelter. Do you understand that that's personal? We didn't start it, but I cannot allow people to fire at my family like that. So what happens is we retaliate, we start taking out the rocket launchers, we start taking out the infrastructure, we ta start taking the, telling the Hamas, stop firing, otherwise we're gonna fire back. But again, this is how it happened, this is what it happened. At some point, next slide if we can put up there, we go a stage further. What you see more than anything depicts what happened last week in Israel. On the right side, you can see probably about 35 rockets fired from Gaza into downtown Israel. On the left side, the squiggly lines are probably 70 interceptors that were fired by Israel's Iron Dome system, if you've heard about that. That's an anti-rocket interceptor system, okay, that is actually being fired to meet those 35 rockets in midair. And if anybody watched what was going on, you saw some of these mid-air battles that are being fought over Israel, where Israel spent billions of dollars and huge amounts of creativity and technology in order to be able to intercept those rockets in mid-air so they don't fall on my mom's head. That's what happened back then. But do you understand the main difference between those two systems? Those rockets being fired are aggressive attack weapons. The Iron Dome on the left, though, as complicated and technologically capable, capable as it is, will never kill anybody. What's it doing? It's defending. And Israel put the Iron Dome up in order not to have to bombard Gaza to a point where they cannot fire anymore. And you're starting to understand a little bit of what's going on. So that was the situation in Gaza. Hamas fired those rockets for Hamas reasons. I can go into the politics, but I'm not going to go to there because I need you to understand something very critical. 
Now that you know the truth, you saw something very different depicted on American media over the last two weeks. You heard something very different. And I'm sitting here and I realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. Something else is going on here. I mean, I can understand the battle, I can understand the battle. But something else is going on in the world today, and that is what I call the war on truth. People have taken the truth and turned it upside down. People have taken the Hamas and turned them into something else. People have taken the realistic objective situation on the ground in Israel and turned it something to upside down and they've done that for their own reasons. And I'm saying, wait a minute, what's going on? First of all, I can understand why they're doing that. Let's remind everybody, I'm Jewish. I'm not surprised when people want to kill me. I know that sounds sad. But anybody know, <laughs> okay, the, here's the famous Jewish Yiddish joke. Okay, anybody know what a Jewish holiday is? You know, Passover, Purim, Hanukkah. All the Jewish holidays have one concept behind them. The concept goes like this. They tried to kill us. They didn't kill us. Let's eat. <laughs> By the way, it's totally true. I mean, in Passover, it was the Egyptians. In Hanukkah, it was the Persians. In Purim, it was the Iranians. By the way, we, we kind of not surprised that the Iran Persians, Iranians, Iranians, Persians, we're not surprised that the Persians want to kill us. I mean, we've already had a holiday con connected to that. But it's only half a joke, because think about growing up celebrating people who want to kill you. I'm not surprised that people want to kill me. I'm only surprised or I'm only thankful or I thank God that God has been preserving his people over the last 2,000 years. I thank God that he has given us the ability to defend our people. I thank God that he has actually not allowed the people who want to kill us to actually kill us. Though, you know, in the Holocaust, it got really, really close there for a while. But in the end, we're standing up saying this. But I also realize that one of the reasons they want to kill us is because we are God's chosen people. And the way the story of Israel was depicted was completely different than the reality on the ground. One of the things I always find amazing, okay, and... and, and I'm hearing people sitting on the television, you know, saying with very, very, how do you say, articulate reasoning, explaining what's going on in Israel. Now, one of the things that I always find weird is that people sitting in the States who do not understand what's going on in Israel are sitting and explaining to you what's going on in Israel. And one of the weird things that I always realize is that would you listen to anybody explaining about what's going on in the United States? Let's say somebody explaining the political system in the United States if he doesn't speak English. How can people here who don't speak Hebrew explain what's going on in my country? By the way, that's one of the rules of thumb. If you want to kind of decide who to listen to and who not to, okay, listen to the people who actually live it, who are actually in there. Just like you wouldn't listen to anybody giving, you know, uh, football information if they don't know the rules of football, okay? Don't listen to anybody giving information about Israel if they've not been there and not seen it and not felt it. If they don't have any skin in the game, I mean, what are we talking about? But I'm seeing people doing, and here's the thing. I'm seeing your society. I'm seeing your culture. I'm seeing your politicians. I'm seeing people that I deem to be normal, reasonable people buying into the lie. And that scares me. And then I start looking a little bit closer, and I say something else is going on. As much as there is a war for Israel, as much as those rockets are a, a, a problem for us, as much as all of that is going on, there is a war for the concept of truth. And you start listening to the news and you start saying, wait a minute, you start hearing people in your society, and I'm hearing more and more of this on, on different kind of levels, people saying there's relative truth. People saying, there's my truth and there's your truth. People saying, there's false truth and accepting it. False truth. False news. How much have you heard? And what I'm realizing is that as a society, we've dropped the ball of truth.
Truth is not an issue anymore. Truth doesn't matter anymore. People don't really need the truth. We're accepting the fact that truth can be relative. We're accepting the fact that there's one narrative and there's another narrative and each one is, can be as truthful as the other. The problem is that I know and you know that that's wrong. That's not the truth. And the Bible says again and again, it's all about the truth. Your country has been built on Christian values, Judeo-Christian values. One of those values is the rule of law and truth. And the Bible actually mentions truth. I don't know if you realize this, 224 times. The word truth. It's always about the truth. And let's see if I can pull up a slide. Let's see if I can remind you just some of the times that the truth was a major issue. Quotes. No, let's go one more. By the way, that's very interesting. No, no, one back. Sorry, back, back, back. I'm, I'm sorry, my telepathy is kind of work. So let's go back to a slide about truth. Okay. Let's see if I can pull this one up. Sorry about this. No, this isn't going to work. Come on, help me out here. I'm going to read these. You can follow in your Bible if you want. Just so we get the idea. Psalm 43.3 Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. John says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Um, and the woman said to Elijah in 1 Kings 17, 24, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. And this is the one I like more than anything else. Stand therefore, having, um, excuse me, let little children, let us love not in word or talk, but in deed and in truth our society has decided that truth is not important our culture has decided that truth is not the issue we live in a society in a culture who worships not the truth not what is but worships, and I'm going to use the word because I need you to kind of get this in a little bit deeper. We worship the idols. Let's hit this. You all know this one. Oh, yeah. So we got those. No, I, I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm going a little bit further. Let's go a little bit further. I'm going to see if I can pull off. Um, well, let, let's, let, let's paraphrase a couple of these. When Moses comes off the mountain with the most amazing idea that changes the world, what are the people doing? Dancing around what? The golden calf. Why the golden calf? What are the people saying? We need something tangible. The truth has to be real in our minds. The truth has to be something that we can touch. The truth has to be something that is shiny. The truth has to be something that is new. And what we're seeing more and more is a world where the truth is becoming something completely different. Our leaders are not people who have truth. Our leaders are people who have this. By the way, anybody know where this comes from? The thumbs up? How many likes they have? Anybody know where the, the original thumbs up comes from? It comes from the Colosseum in Rome. It comes from Christians having their lives decided by this or by this. Do you know what the Colosseum is? The arena in Rome where the Christians were brought in, put on that sand, and used as a spectacle for the Roman people. And that's where this symbol comes from. I don't know if you understand that. It is the truth of being liked. And you're 
life is decided by how many people like you and how many people don't like you. Our leaders have become the people who have more likes. It's not about what they've done. It's not about what they teach. It's not about what they say. It's about how many people like them. We've turned our comedians into leaders. And we've turned our leaders into comedians. I mean, you know, it, it's about how it gets completely turned upside down. We are forgetting that the Bible told us that we are responsible for the truth. And here's the thing. Without truth, there's no such thing as right and wrong. Which means without truth, everything is relative. We don't even know if he's a man or a woman. It doesn't really matter anymore. And here's the weird thing. When I was realizing as I was trying to put together what's going on with Israel and what's happening with Israel, what I was realizing, realizing more and more is I can bring the truth. But people don't care about the truth anymore. People say, it doesn't matter. what does it matter what the truth is? I heard, uh, what was his name? Trevor Noah. He says, I don't even know what the truth is about Israel and the Palestinians anymore. I don't know what you've just now heard. I haven't gone into it. I'm not going to go into it. If I can't understand it in 30 seconds on TikTok, it doesn't really matter. So if there's no truth, if the truth doesn't matter, how do we decide what's important and what's not? By our feelings. And we live in a world that has turned feelings into truth a world that has turned feelings into right and wrong and god never asked us how our how we feel god never judged us by how we feel god never wrote the bible about what people feel what did he write about what you do about who you are about your truth god has said to us over and over again your feelings are one thing I will hold you accountable for what you do. And we have forgotten this. Now, why am I standing here saying this? Because I explained to you what's going on in Israel, and I'm going to tell you truthfully, I'm not worried. I mean, no, there's a problem. I mean, there is, there's a danger. But I'm not worried because I tell you, at the end of this, Israel will be here. God has promised us that we're going all the way to the final chapter. Okay, so I'm not really worried about that. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you, your children, your country, your community, your culture. Because when you drop the truth along the way, you are moving into a realm where nothing actually matters anymore. Where everything is relative. Everything is on a gray scale. It's a little bit here and a little bit there. And what you've basically done is taken this out of the equation. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I want you to understand what's going on. I want you to understand because I'm sitting here looking at an Israeli looking at it, and I can see that nobody cares about the truth anymore. I can sit here and explain the whole Palestinian problem. I can make a PowerPoint presentation and put it all in there, and then people look at me and say, it doesn't matter. I mean, does it fit into TikTok in 20 seconds? Otherwise, it's not worth anything. And that's what's happening, and that's where we're going. So what I need to do is, first of all, remind you that there is such a thing as truth. God told us that there is truth. God holds us accountable to how truthful we are. One. Two, the enemy is using this lack of truth to mix you up. Okay, what does it matter if he's a girl, he's a boy? I mean, it doesn't really matter. What does it matter if they're shooting or they're shooting? It doesn't really matter. What does it matter if he's right or he's right? It doesn't really matter. It's all relative. No, it's not all relative. There is right and there is wrong. And don't forget it. And what I'm asking you to do in a world that is going to go down that way as much as possible, okay, stand up for the truth. Because he who stands up for the truth is standing up for God. And that's what I'm here to remind you. So, oh yeah, and scare you a little bit. As you heard, I grew up in a country that was mostly Jewish. And I grew up as a Christian in a Jewish environment. 
very unique kind of situation because after 2,000 years of Jews being persecuted, okay, finally we have a Jewish nation. But it was really hard growing up as a, as a Christian in a, Jewish, in a Jewish environment because I don't know how many times, you know, I've had kids look at me and say, in third grade, I still remember, third or fourth grade, you know, what, you're a Christian? I say, yes, you know. And, you know, really, you're really a Christian? I said, yes. And you're those people who killed us all the years that we learned in, you know, history lesson? I said, no, no, that's not me. Okay, but, okay, and then, People would say to me, wait a minute, after all of these years of being persecuted by Christians, why do we need Christians in Israel? Why do we need Christians in the Jewish state? That was usually the question before I got beat up. And we learned to run very, very fast. But what I'm trying to say is that I grew up being persecuted. You see, this is me trying to say this is all. Being persecuted for my Christianity. You grew up in a world that is mostly Christian. And your Christianity has been accepted. You can celebrate Christmas. You can celebrate Easter. You know, and, and, and it's part of this. But I'm sorry to say that the further your society moves away from the truth, the further they're going to move away from Christianity. And it's just a generation or two, and you, your children, or your grandchildren are going to be persecuted for being Christian. Because if the, Christ, if the truth doesn't matter, Christianity is abomination. You guys follow me on this one. Prepare yourselves. Prepare yourselves for a different kind of society. Prepare your children to be unaccepted because they do stand up for the truth and they do stand up for Jesus. And start thinking about how you're going to live in a society that doesn't accept your Christianity the way that everybody else does. So I'm here to remind you of what happened in Israel. I'm here to remind you that there is such a thing as truth. I'm here to remind you that Christianity is something that you have to not take for granted. It's not something you're not going to be able to meet like this, or I don't know how long you're going to be able to meet like this on a regular basis. How long your children or your grandchildren will be connected to this. I'm here to remind you that you have an obligation to God's chosen people. And I'm here to say, we need your help and support, but you need to start thinking about how you support your own communities. And more than anything, if I can come out of this, how you support this and everything that it means. Because this stands for a concept that says there is such a thing as truth, there is such a thing as right, there is such a thing as of, of wrong, and don't give up on what God says. And when you're asking yourself what's true and what's not, come back to here. Usually you're going to find the answer in here. And now, I know I'm speaking in a church where the pastors probably said the same thing many times. I wanted to bring it on a political level and put it together. And before I go, since this is my Memorial Day, I want to say one more thing. And this is me personally. I've been a warrior all my life. And I, I just heard, you know, you're talking about all the people who gave up their lives for this country. Uh, uh, last January, I was in Arlington National Cemetery. I went to meet an interesting, or went to see the tomb of an interesting man named Ord Wingate. If you want to check that out, somebody write down that name. If you want a story about a born-again Christian who makes a difference, he's, he's a very good one. But I want to say something personal about your Memorial Day. Usually you connect a Memorial Day to all the people who went to war, lost their lives, or lost a leg, and came back in any way, shape, or form. I've been in battle many times. Here's something that most Americans freak out when I say. I've killed many, many people. I say that with a lot of, not shame, but with a lot of sorrow. Can you, can you make the differentiation between, I'm not ashamed, I'm very, very sorrowful for what I've done. But even winning wars comes at a price. I've paid the price. So what I want you to do is reach out to the people who did come back. Most of them will not tell the story. I can tell you stories from here for the next week. But reach out to the people who did come back because it's not only the ones who didn't come back who pay, pay the price for your freedom. It's the one who went out there, put their lives on the line, and then came back. So if you want to, if, if I can say this, reach out to the people who did come back. They deserve your support and your respect as much as the ones who didn't come back.